Welcome back to B Great Economics. This is Nate. I'm going to do a market update. Uh, I am not a professional trader. I make some general uh, attempts at increasing my opportunity as prices move up and down and try to trade the volatility within the assets that I hold for maximized profits and protection. I do not trade like day trade. I am not a professional at any of this. Um, I just do this to help hedge and improve my position. Uh, so overall, uh, we saw the FOMC meeting met expectations. Now, meeting expectations, I think, was a bit of a staged event where you saw the Federal Reserve come out with statements regarding uh, the decreasing of asset purchases via a taper. They're going to stop buying as many bonds and mortgage-backed securities. Uh, I don't know if that happens or not, because I don't think that the market can really support a reduction of the Fed balance sheet. I think they might, for a period of time, begin reducing their balance sheet to an extent. Uh, for a sh very short period of time, less than a month, they'll let the market slightly fall and then they'll let it pump back up. And we will see that they'll say, oh, we we reduced some of our taper. We increased our rate of taper. Uh, we see that the market is fine. But what they ended up doing is actually increasing asset prices anyways, because I don't think that the structure can support itself right now as people are very attentive to uh, the Fed's response. And so we see that all of these assets kind of struggled on the second day afterwards as they first started to make a boom meeting expectations and then they started the, the realization that the taper may be coming and an increase in lending rate uh, rate hike will be coming as well uh, the bond market predicted three and the fed announced three so tie there i think that uh overall this has a potential to lead to some corrective behavior later but for now, we're seeing some volatility increase. We're going to see a little bit of sideways chop. We see that the bond market's inflation fears back here. Remember, I have uh, this on Twitter as well. Um, the, the, at first, the bond market was afraid of the events of early 2020, and then it started to go into risk on because it started to realize there's a recovery occurring. And then it went into uh, the next variance fears, and then it started to make a recovery on inflation fears. But then... It had to go back down on taper fears. So you can see that the bond market's kind of been oddly manic about its response to the Fed's response. And that's kind of an interesting set of plays here. Uh, the DXY, uh, the, remember this is more important as a reference of a basket of currencies. Uh, the DXY had a wedge here that has disappeared. And so we're kind of out of that. We're into a chop zone. Uh, if the DXY is rising while inflation fears are rising and the bond yield is going up, that could probably mean that uh, uh, foreign investments are flowing into the U.S. And that could be likely since most other major nations, inflation greatly exceeds our own. Uh, so they'd be looking for dollar denominated assets. So this way they can hedge their risk against inflation. Meanwhile, uh, the U.S. investors are going to be looking at the same thing, uh, hedging their bets against inflation by purchasing stocks and other assets of the like. Historically, that does generally work as a hedge to purchase uh, S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, um, but they are extremely overvalued. So as a hedge, it's not a very small portion of your portfolio. Now on Bitcoin, uh, I continue to point out that um, we have a constantly diminishing supply. And so what I think we're up against is an extremely low volume. Let me pull volume in here real quick. We have an extremely low volume. Uh, and when I say extremely low, I mean 2019 to market cap low on, what was it, the weeklies where I saw this and I posted about it. Um, we have such low volume that we're, we're nearing or at, depending on the exchange you look at, this one's Coinbase, the amount of lack of trading going on as we did in a bear market. So do we capitulate from here? Maybe. We're going to see illiquidity be a problem. And that, I think, could give you a potential risk of another liquidation event like this. But we also see that on uh, some exchanges like Bybit, we're seeing uh, tens of millions of dollars in, in uh, bearish activity and it's not doing a lot. So I, uh, like uh, uh, they're doing, um, they're doing uh, shorts here. And so I don't think that we're gonna see necessarily massive liquidation without a major event occurring. Now on the weekend, that could be a bigger risk so just i would still hedge your bet while we're inside of this zone here once you get above this line we're looking a lot better and so yes it can go up or it can go down right uh, but once we get above this line we're going to start seeing a lot more health into the system if we can set up retest and resume 
Uh, and I think that everything in it in general is set up to handle that. We just need to see the momentum pick up. If we fall below this trend line, this is very important. And I would go start going risk off to this because it would probably reflect, again, the 10 years response. Now, if the Federal Reserve reduces its asset purchases, the 10 years should start climbing because they're a 40% buyer. Uh, if the Fed's um, reduction of purchases last temporarily, the market may just start responding to this and start acting as, a, oh, this is a signal, right? And so it's kind of a false signal if they reduce their asset purchases slightly and then increase them again and allow it so that this way the money can start flowing uh, by reduction of fear. And so I just would watch out for that. Uh, Ethereum trading a lot like the NASDAQ. You want to um, generally see that the NASDAQ is performing well before you bet on Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum versus Bitcoin, uh, it could outperform if the market is doing well uh, and uh, continue from there. But if Bitcoin gets a very big set of candles, you could see a lot of sideways action in Ethereum Bitcoin trade for a bit as uh, Bitcoin does its traditional lead. I'm not going to cover altcoins because they're not really macro focused. And uh, this is one of the first videos I'm going to be doing for everyone. So I'm just going to go do a quick coverage here on gold. Uh, gold, we see a breakout occurring uh, from this downtrend. Uh, we are still inside of this uh, general box. I think that the inflation projections from both the Fed and everyone else's general sentiment that it will continue on an uptrend is going to allow gold to stay a little bullish. But I'm going to bring you to silver, and I think, and I've been covering this uh, for months, um, that silver is on a uh, Wyckoff accumulation, most likely. And so what I'm concerned about is the macro probability that uh, silver is signaling to us with this, with this Wyckoff accumulation that we're going to get an uptrend. Uh, people are going to try to call for higher numbers, and then it will stop out. We don't know how, it'll depend on how the market performs, it'll set this arc. But once we come into phase C, if we see a spring event, this is what concerns me. At the current rate, we should see the spring event sometime heading into summer 22. The Fed's tapering is supposed to end in March and the rate hike is supposed to start in March. So if we see that these events line up, we could see a crash and that concerns me. And so what I'm gonna cover here is just a quick review of the model that I've built based off of uh, Stair University um, thesis paper on the performance of gold as an inflation hedge, followed by, I did an analysis on market corrections. There are extrapolations into how the bond market responds because there isn't good evidence for this. So I did have to make some assumptions because the QE distorts the information because the bond market has gone down instead of up in, in uh, or gone up in price instead of down, but we have seen a breakout of it before it starts going down from the quantitative, quantitative easing purchases of bonds and mortgage-backed securities. And so what I, what I believe occurs here based off of what most of the data tells me is that we get a crash, gold does its recovery. Remember we saw $2,000 gold, then gold started to fall pretty rapidly. You get a swing up in stocks and the risk on mantra begins to occur because of the inflationary pressures tell us, oh, we can go risk on. Then the inflation fears begin to kind of give us some sideways chop uh, because of whether or not this will perform and the guidance that you're going to get from the central banks around the world is going to be that they want to control inflation. And since the market is trading on this inflation, it kind of gets confused. And what we're seeing today, I think we've confirmed that we are in this third phase here, this upturn in stocks. Now, there's reason for me to believe that this is not going to turn into a, a, a crash immediately, but there's also reasons to think that it could. So we have to just keep paying attention and see an uptrend restart or resume. If we do go into this uptrend, we can see that gold will probably keep selling off. And then when it finally does crash, gold will crash, but not as much. And then it will start making a recovery at a faster rate than the stock market, as it has historically. Uh, and then the inflation fears uh, or the stock market crash fears will push up bonds into new highs, which is what the bond market is expecting, only to then sell off into the inflation fears and the uh, failing issues here. And so this cycle can repeat until we've washed out any interest in bonds outside of the Federal Reserve's purchases uh, or the central bank of any type. And so I, I think that that is generally how this game theory should play out based off of past performance. Uh, but since we haven't had this level of events, the end results are an extrapolation on some information 
that is not quite clear because every time it's different. So I think that this is a probability. A crash doesn't have to be a real crash. We could see a negative 2% real return in the stock market under inflation, right? Like over year over year. And so it starts to go, hey, I need to seek yield elsewhere. And the fears of tapering and rate hikes cause bonds to climb a little bit more in real terms as opposed to in uh, nominal terms. And then they start selling off because of inflation fears. And then gold gets bid up or monetary assets get bid up because of inflation fears. So I've said this with Bitcoin is that there is a probability that if we get a crash, recovery will be very rapid and swift due to the fact that we will probably see more injects of stimulus, whether it's from the Federal Reserve, monetary policy, or from the uh, government. Uh, fiscal policy. And so you just want to be aware that if this model uh, properly and accurately predicts the role and function of a market's response uh, based off of past performance, then there's a probability that this is what occurs here instead of just a dip and immediate recovery in stocks. And even if the stocks begin to recover due to, again, another inflationary, we just set off the same cycle and the metals perform. But I think that you start to watch a game theory play out where the metals just keep outperforming everything else because you start to head into a really high inflationary response. Now, on the final note here, just to belay some of these excessive uh, uh, fears of a crash in the immediate term, the Federal Reserve has a history of raising uh, rates, causing a disruption during the beginning of the raise of rates, and then allowing the market to go into even more booms before it hits a threshold that the market can no longer handle, and then the market crashes. And they're a little delayed in lowering the rates once the market starts to crash. So they were faster in 2000, 2007, 2008. They're faster in 2008, but the rates have been on a decline. Uh, so, and they've had to hold them down at zero here in order to keep the market happy. Uh, and so 2018, we even saw this where we had to lower rates again, and then we had 2020. Uh, so what I think occurs is that you don't even need much. You could, I don't even think we'll have to hit 1% based off this trend. You won't have to hit 1% rate in order, to, uh, in order to crash the market, in order to make it find its wall because of how much leverage is already in it. But we're going to get a chop here because of the talk of it, which is kind of what occurs here, what occurs uh, here, right? You get a little bit of a chop before you finally get to go off into a blow off top because the market finally accepts that this is happening and continues to make decisions. So uh, good luck, uh, pay attention, and uh, I hope that this helps improve macro understanding of how markets respond to the Federal Reserve. I will continue to monitor and cover. I'll probably do a weekly stock coverage of those key assets that I uh, talked about. I Again, I am not a professional trader. What I do is I just hedge and, and manage my position. So when I think that there's more risk, I add a hedge. If I think there's more reward, then I add leverage. Uh, and I have stop losses and that's about it. So right now I'm sideways in a lot of assets because I don't have a clear picture on how the next performance will be. The only thing that I really feel confident in uh, moving at least a little bit up is silver, but that even is still dependent on market response. So um, have a great day uh, and to your wealth.